Um, we shall get started here. Uh, I have a question before we get started. I want to know how many people like to dig into facts and uh, learn about things that you never thought about. But, uh, you know, after like digging into uh, just say the Bible, because that's what I'm talking about, digging into the Bible, you find new things that you never thought were there in the first place. Well, that's, that's what we're going to sort of do tonight, have some fun and, and uh, learn some things. Like Pastor Stan says, we, we learn things every, every time we come together. But, um, you know, I'm just going to present a, a bunch of facts that you probably either didn't know about, haven't heard about, but yet they are in the Bible. So let me get my screen up here. And start my show. All right. So things you probably never knew were in the Bible. So that's what we're going to be uh, talking about, just a series of things and uh, then I've got a, a short video at the end if we get to that. But um, let's look at some of these things. The first one, the Bible tells you not to eat eagles. Did you know that? And um, so <laughs> in case you were thinking about eating eagles, uh, the Bible says don't eat them. And that comes from Leviticus. So don't eat eagle. That's right. Leviticus 11, 13 through 19 clearly states it in the surprising list of specific birds. It says, these are the birds you are to regard as unclean and not eat because they are unclean. The first one listed is the eagle. Then the vulture, the black vulture, the red kite, any kind of black kite, any kind of raven, the horned owl, the screech owl, the gull, any kind of hawk, the little owl, the cormorant, uh, the great owl, the white owl, the desert owl, the osprey, the stork, and any kind of heron, the uh, hoopy and the bat. So all of those things, make sure they are not on your menu tomorrow. So um, how many of how many have ever eaten any one of those that's listed? None? Pastor Sam, you haven't? Well, I knew people who ate uh, the hawk and the uh, all the all kinds of the gall. They didn't eat owls or we didn't have eagles in our area mm -hmm. where we grew up at. Well, that's good. Nobody, well, make sure you uh, uh, And the stalk <laughs> is probably too skinny to eat. And that, anyway, uh, well, nobody thanks. ate bats. But yeah, they ate eagles. And uh, and actually, raven is part of the uh, the, the blackbird family. I thought people right? eat. I thought people eat hawk. I mean, you know, I thought that was one of the birds that people. Which one? Hawk. Oh yeah, they eat hawk not as regularly. If, if it was kind of desperation, they have the rabbit population or other kind of animals were, and you needed protein, you know, mm -hmm. then anything that would get in your sight, they probably would eat. That, you know. <laughs> okay, well that's in the Bible, mm -hmm. and uh, it tells you because these are considered unclean. Well, the under the Levitical law, right? Yes, exactly. That's what we're. That's why I say Leviticus. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but <it's... laughs> so I don't think we we uh, you know I don't think we we're gonna shop at uh, uh, Schnooks for kite. Uh -huh. parts, you mean you're not, owl. Gonna, you're not going to have an owl for Thanksgiving? <laughs> Scratch it off your list. Okay, uh, let's go okay. on. Let's go on. <laughs> okay. Um, oops. How do I put that on? Okay. Uh, it's a strange looking guy. Who is that? Uh, 
Oh, I got something out of order. Okay. Okay, well, that's Moses. Pastor Yvonne, I have a question. Uh huh. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so under the Levitical law, that meaning that was for the that period. The it, yes, the Israelites then. Exactly. Like, yes. If we us Christians today, it if we wanted to eat eagle. That would be okay. Oh, yes. It would be okay, but let me tell you that there's a lot of things in Levitical law uh, that is mentioned, you know, for the Israelites not to do or not to eat. Uh, yes. But um, like you said, it's okay now, but is it good for you? Is it proper yes. for you? Yes. Exactly. Okay. So there's a lot of things that uh, is is generally uh, bad for everybody, you know. So what there were uh, reasons why they weren't supposed to do those things. Uh, I mean, the re the law was there for a reason. It wasn't just because, just because. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, exactly. God those wanted them the to do or not do things for specific reasons. Exactly. Maybe because it was unhealthy unhealthy or, unclean well he said unclean it says yes. unclean so you know uh it could be because of what they eat um you know yes. we're and they were not supposed to eat uh uh fish with scales no fish uh, without i mean scales. not fish fish without scales i had it backwards mm -hmm. and uh so um, some of the things that we eat now would not be proper under, to eat under the Levitical law. Mm -hmm. Like chitlins, you can eat chitlins. For no, but what is a, a fish in the water or uh, is it the, like lobster? I was going to say like shrimp, shrimp, shrimp the, uh, with the vein in the inside or something like that. Well, basically, what uh, one of the reasons that God gave the Jews different rules and regulations. He wanted to set aside his people to do certain things that the rest of the people did not do and stuff. You know, they were a special people and they followed a special law that the other people did not follow. If some of it was health reason, right? but there's That's nothing so wrong with catfish, but we were never to eat a catfish, you know, under the Levitical law because they do not have a scale, you know. Mm -hmm. We know pork has a lot of good protein and minerals and stuff in it now, but we were not to eat pork. Right. You know? No, mm -hmm. they weren't. Mm -hmm. But okay. we know that it's, that it's good. Okay. Now, there are some uh, people who still try to live by that Levitical law, like the Seven Day Adventists and people of that sort. You know, they try to follow that law, mm -hmm. but they always because come Because it is a law, it. not for necessarily mm -hmm. health reasons. Mm -hmm. And right. then that's that's when it becomes uh, bad mm -hmm. uh, because God has really, we're not under that. So we don't have to do it uh, mm -hmm. for salvation. They, you know, they even look at it as if I do this, this is harmful to my salvation. And that's when it becomes wrong. Right. You know, if you, if you just say, I'm not going to eat pork because of health reasons, mm -hmm. that's totally different. Mm -hmm. but, but Paul uh, told us to never sure to Paul told us never to argue if you're with someone and they say they don't want to eat pork say that's fine for you you know exactly mm -hmm. or if they don't want if they're vegetarian say that's fine for you but I'm going home and having hamburger but basically oh. you know when Peter you know remember when Peter God told right. you in his famous you know mm -hmm. dream that he had you know you can eat you can eat in other words, you can eat anything. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, this is Moses. I had a little, uh, I don't know what happened to my uh, screen, but uh, see the horns? Did you know that Moses had horns? <laughs> what? Uh, well, not really. <laughs> not really, but this is why 
some thought so. When Moses came, uh, comes down from Mount Sinai in Exodus 34, verses 29 and 35, it says his face is shining. Now, the Vulgate <laughs> um, translation of the Bible, and we'll talk about the Vulgate <laughs> in a minute, says that uh, his face had horns instead of the shine. So uh, where our translation, the King James, New King James says that, you know, his face was shining. He had been in the presence of God. Their translation says that he had horns. Mm. So this reading of the text is based on Egyptian and Babylonian gods with horns. It's a complete misreading, but it did inspire Michael, uh, Michelangelo's Moses, the painting of Moses. And that's it. Mm. Uh, the real answer that is traditionally given to this question is that Jerome, the translator of the Bible into Latin, which would subsequently become the Vulgate, made a mistake or worse, deliberately wanted to uh, 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 demonize, should be demonize the founding figure mm. of Judaism. Mm. Okay? Mm. Now the Vulgate translation where this is found uh, is the principal Latin version of the Bible, prepared mainly by uh, St. Jerome in the late fourth century. And it was adopted as the official text of the Roman Catholic Church. Ooh. So the Vulgate is what the Catholic is, is the main text or translation um, for Catholicism, okay? All right. Oh, I did not know that. That's what I wanted to hear somebody say. I didn't know that. Okay, what does Bethel mean? Other than there's a Bethel church on almost every other corner <laughs> in a major city, uh, we're going to find out what Bethel means. Okay. Uh, that's a picture of who? That's a drawing of who? You see the angels going up and down the ladder? Is that Jacob? Yeah, that's yeah. Jacob. And he had that dream with the angels descending and ascending up and, you know, up and down the ladder. Okay. Uh -huh. So yes. we know Bethel to be the place where Jacob had his dream in uh, Genesis 28. But did you know that Bethel means house of Eli? or house of God, which might make sense to that the judge, uh, that in Judges 20, verse 26 and 27, we read that the Ark of the Covenant was kept in Bethel. Today, Bethel is said to be the Israeli uh, settlement in Beth El. Um, that scripture in uh, Judges reads, then all the children of Israel, that is, all the people, went up and came to the house of God and wept. They sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until evening, and, and they offered burnt, um, offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. So the children of Israel inquired of the Lord. The Ark of the Covenant of, of God was there in those days, mentioning the house or the, uh, I'm sorry, the covenant of God was at Bethel, uh, which is also known as the house of Eli. Okay, that was also the place where Jacob mm. had his dream. Okay, mm. so uh, Ark of the Covenant, what is that? Uh, the Ark of the Covenant in the Bible, in Exodus 25, 10, Moses received the command to build an Ark of Acadia wood. Now within this Ark, it was a square box, Within this ark were to be placed the tablets of the law, which God was about to give to Moses. So this was the place or this was the box that um, Moses uh, was to put uh, the tablets of stone that God had given him with the Ten Commandments. There's a little picture to your left. Um, when they were in the wilderness, um, when the children of Israel was, were moving through the wilderness, 
they would carry the ark uh, with them wherever they would go. And you know that they moved from place to place for that 40 years in the wilderness and they would set up camp and they would set up a, a place of worship. And inside this place of worship um, was, they would put the Ark of the Covenant, which contained the laws of God. And uh, so you, there's a little picture there. Upon, okay, okay, upon top of the Ark, probably not as a lid, but above the lid was a golden plate upon which two cherubim with raised wings and facing each other covered the ark. So it was like these two giant birds. You can kind of see it, see it on that picture. And they covered the ark. From the, from the place between the two cherubim, God promised to speak to Moses as often as he shall give his commandments in reference to the Israelites. So basically, um, it was a, uh, the, the Ark of the Covenant was the place where God's laws rested or were. And uh, it was a very special sacred box. Uh, God gave them specific um, details on how that box was supposed to be made, what it was supposed to be made out of, and all of the details. And um, that uh, was Bethel. It came from Bethel. Uh, did you know if you preach too long, this might happen? So don't preach too long. If you preach too long, you might put some of your audience to sleep. And y'all better not go to sleep on me tonight just because I said that. <laughs> if you put, put your audience to sleep, someone might fall from the balcony. If someone falls from the balcony, he might die. If he dies, you'll need to resurrect him. Uh, uh, resurrect him. That's what happened to Paul in Trosis when e Etacus sunk into a deep sleep after Paul kept preaching past midnight. Okay. Thankfully, Paul was able to perform the needed miracle. And that is in Acts chapter 20. Let's see, did I put that up there? Yeah. Okay. Pretty interesting story. Um, beginning at verse seven, it says, now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, uh, ready to depart the next day, he spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. And in a window sat a certain young man named Etakis. E Am I pronouncing that, pa Pastor Sam, correctly? Etakis, <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> who, was, who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep. And as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down, fell on him, and embraced him and said, do not trouble yourself, for his life is in him. Mm -hmm. In other words, he's not dead. Now, when he had come up, had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till daybreak, he departed. And they brought the young man in alive, and they were not a little comforted. So, you know, if you preach too long, especially past midnight, you might have people falling out of the windows and, you know, doing all kinds of strange. So that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Uh, did Mary ride a donkey? You know, this famous picture that we see around Christmas. Anybody remember that, um, what it says about Mary riding a donkey? 
Anybody remember the, the story we tell around Christmas to the kids all the time? When they went into Jerusalem? Nobody remembers that? Okay. Well, here's another picture. We, we can just see Mary on that donkey, can't we? Mm -hmm. We've seen all of Christmas movies where Mary rode the donkey into, I said Jerusalem, into Nazareth with Joseph rock, walking, guiding the animal, right? If you look through all of the gospels, it's not there. The text of the journey in Luke chapter two, verses one through six, and there's no mention of a donkey. Though not mentioned, we might assume it. The trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem is about 100 miles, which may have taken them as many as 10 days to walk. The whole journey is given, given in three lines of the Bible. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 4, says, And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, into the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house in the lineage of David. And so, you know, they had to go and they had to pay their taxes. They, that's why they were on the road in the first place. And um, it was tax time. And uh, verse five, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife. They weren't married yet. They were like, to us, it would be engaged, but it's even more than being engaged. Um, and she was great with child, verse six. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. This is all it says about their journey. There is no mention that um, Mary jumped up on a donkey, a horse, or any other type of uh, animal. But we always see that. And, um, you know, in our mind's eye, they say we can see those pictures that we see in all of the nativity scenes or the movies rather, uh, where they are taking that long trip uh, to uh, Nazareth to pay the taxes. And, you know, they had to stay in the stable all of, because people were there to pay their taxes. All, you know, all of the rooms were filled. And so the only place that they had was the, the inn, the, the uh, stable area. So if I can, I, yeah. Can I say something? When yes. you think about it, <clears throat> she was near birth anyway, and probably to ride on a donkey that would that would not have been good, <laughs> you know. Right, her right. Up and down, she could have had the baby anywhere, so she probably was either walking or uh, I'm, probably I'm, walking. Huh? Just on, probably walking. That was yeah. the only form of uh, transportation. transportation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That I was going to say maybe in a buggy or uh, maybe uh, something like that, but mm -hmm. I don't even know if they had buggies back then. That would be a, a bad ride, too, because you still would be bumping up and down because if it's on a road, unless the road was smooth. I doubt it. You know yeah. what it looks like. In, in not, the yeah, they didn't have land, Nothing but rocks. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Which is pretty tough to mentioned. walk 100 miles pregnant then. Mm -hmm. People was a little tougher then, I guess. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just think of the whole trip period, like yeah. Pastor Sam said, just to, for anybody in good condition, not not pregnant to walk 100 miles, and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but everybody had to make that trip. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you couldn't mail it in like we mail our taxes, you know, you can't. Was it, you wasn't know, it also a, a census time, too? Don't they, didn't they take the census? Uh, well, not at this particular time. Okay. Um, this, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's this, why they had to go to be counted, right. I, well, if you... That's why they had to take the trip, you know. Okay, so I guess if you say be counted as they're paying their taxes, do they 
Did they right. do the do it at the same time. Yeah, they probably at the same time. time. Okay, Mm. okay. But I thought that was pretty interesting. To walk that for, yes. Mm -hmm. But no mention, but we always see these movies and pictures Mm -hmm. uh, of different things, Mm -hmm. uh, including the stable, um, the nativity scene. There were no animals. It doesn't say there were animals there. And well, all of the pictures we got, I think we got a little nativity scene that we set up and we got a little donkey and we got a little horse and we got, you know, things yeah. that we set around and, right, you know, no, no mention of that. So I think this was uh, in, the, uh, you know, the minds of the artists when they uh, did pictures and um movies and things like that i guess to make it even more interesting but that's how we can pick up things and live with it (laughs) for all of our lives and never you know just because of something that we see okay Mm -hmm. go on 185,000 dead. What is this all about? 185. Anybody know what story I'm getting ready to talk about? Well, usually, well, I don't want to give away. I okay. just finished reading that. Okay. I, well, I read it all. All right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Let's, um, there's another picture of the 185. All of these pictures are, of course, artist renditions of times back there of course okay king hezekiah hezekiah is one of the last kings of the southern tribes of judah okay the northern tribes of israel you know we're talking about a divided kingdom israel is to the north and judah is to the south the northern tribes of israel had been taken into exile by assyria And to this day, those tribes are considered lost. But Judah has been spared for the moment. Now, Assyria is back to take the prize of Jerusalem and Hezekiah's crown. Assyria was the bad people, the bad guys. All appears hopeless. Assyria's massive army surrounding Jerusalem's wall. Then one night, an angel went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp, an angel. Mm -hmm. When the people got up the next morning, there were all of these dead bodies all over the place. Okay, according to 2 Kings 1935. Mm -hmm. The deaths forced the Assyrians to flee in embarrassment and disbelief. So they thought they were getting ready to take Hezekiah and Jerusalem out and knock down the walls and just do massive damage. And instead, an angel of the Lord slew 185,000 of the Assyrians and left them all over the place dead. Okay, mm-hmm. let's read, uh, um, read this. Uh, Second Kings 19.35, and it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred fourscore and 5,000. That's 185,000. And when they arose early the, in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. So in this verse, a number of naturalistic explanations have been offered. People try to explain what probably could have happened in in an attempt to account for this extraordinary event, but none have and can suffice. So, you know, you get all of these theologians, all these people, well, probably this happened or they got overcome by gas or, no, they didn't have gas. You know, something they just people just don't want to believe what God did. Mm-hmm. You know, so I've they got a question, Pastor Yvonne. 
What is, I'm sorry. I have an explanation. Okay, what is? Oh, the angels killed the 185,000. <laughs> 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 you are right. Yeah. <laughs> and sudden, uh, the sudden death of 185,000 soldiers without assistance from any human or other natural agency cannot possibly be explained except as a supernatural event. Yes. It was supernatural. Yes. And that's why we kind of missed the boat. We don't think we have a whole, we try to keep everything in a natural as opposed to being the angels or supernatural beings. Mm -hmm. How many watched the movie, uh, a new modern movie they made, uh, Deviation, Divination? I always trouble pronouncing that. Divination. Divination, yes. Mm -hmm. Anybody watch that movie? Nope. Except Sister Donna. <laughs> Sister Donna told me about it, to watch it. And that, yeah. uh, it's on my list. I haven't watched it yet. Uh, I said, I said she is, to watch, but I haven't watched it yet. Oh, you got other people watching, and you're not even watching. <laughs> 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 but in that movie, in that movie, that same angel was sent to watch over a house that was being under attack. And another angel walked up to him and said, Wow, it's such a pleasure meeting you. You're the angel that killed 185,000 soldiers. <laughs> 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 oh okay oh wow <laughs> but yeah. i basically that was i i love first and second king and that you know yeah and i love hezekiah and that, and that story and so that was a really really interesting you know story Amen. Amen. It's, it was just a movie it was nothing you know oh the divination about some hollywood type movie well, it was yeah. made by uh pure flicks i think and that, you know mm -hmm. uh, okay all right. Um, Satan's first name named appearance. Anybody know where Satan's uh, for, uh name is first? Uh, I'm sorry, where Satan's name first appears in the Bible. Anybody? Okay. Well, let's see. Let's. I was gonna say, is it in Genesis? That's what I was gonna say too. <laughs> no, and what verse would that be? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> verse. No, I mean, what? What? Oh, I mean, give me close to a chapter and a verse, uh, or you know, just tell me what you're thinking about. I was thinking that's the when, serpent in the garden, right? That's yeah. what I'm thinking. Uh, you say a serpent. I was gonna say it's, it's, he, the it's, it's even Adam. Yeah. It's not well, it's where not, God told um, Eve uh, about um, something about the hill. I can't even remember exactly. I can't say the scripture, but where God where, was talking to where uh, Satan's Eve. name first appeared. Oh, maybe not. Okay. okay. Be, quiet. Quiet. Be quiet, Joyce. No, no. <laughs> okay. That's what this is all about. We're just talking it out. Okay, because I'm just telling you because I'm learning a lot of this. Okay, so I just I, I like to dig into stuff. Okay, so in First Chronicles 21, 1, and Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. It's the first named appearance of Satan, First Chronicles 21, 1. Oh, the name appearance, okay. Yes, we in, infer him to be present in Eden, but he goes unnamed in the story. Okay. So why did God allow Satan to tempt David with a census? Since a census would show David uh, he his might, perhaps God is concerned about the king's pride and sense of independence. Most theologians believe Satan does not make an appearance in Genesis 2 and 3 for the simple reason that when the history of the garden was written, the concept of the devil had not been invented. Mm -hmm. 
explaining the serpent in the Garden of Eden as Satan would have been a foreign uh, concept to the ancient authors of the text as referring to Ezekiel's vision as a UFO. You know, but if you Google Ezekiel's vision now, guess what you get? <laughs> You'll see that plenty of people today have made that connection. So at that time, um, you know, people didn't have that uh, that knowledge about Satan, um, you know, and so the writers um, did not put that in there. They used the the serpent um, as far as the garden is concerned, but they didn't use the name Satan. Okay, it's not there. So, <laughs> so it, it really first appears. His name, the name Satan, first appears in First Chronicles 21.1. So it's not in Genesis where we, most people would think it is, but it's not the name Satan. Okay. In fact, while the word Satan appears elsewhere in the Hebrew te uh, Testament, it is never a proper name. Since there is no devil in ancient Israel's worldview, there can't yet um, there can't yet have been a proper name for such a creature. So, in their worldview, the way that they thought, in the way that they were taught in the the Hebrew text at that time, way back there. Um, you know, they didn't have a concept, a worldview of the devil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. And let me share this. Remember, Pastor Yvonne, I was sharing with you that I was witnessing to a person when I was on the uh, uh, voter poll thing, mm -hmm. and she was Jewish, and I mm -hmm. was explaining to her and, and the name, and I mentioned how the enemy, the devil, and she said, she did not believe in, and there is a set of Jewish people who mm -hmm. do not believe in the devil. She said she did not believe in the devil when I was talking to her. She Just said, like they don't yeah, believe in the Messiah. It. Right. When she die here on earth, this will be it mm -hmm. for her. You know, there is no hell, no help. You know, this is totally it. it I think it's, those, it's are the, those were the Sadducees. It's a, it's amazing when you dig into uh, the beliefs of people, mm -hmm. uh, Christian and Jewish, specifically, how and you, and even from one, you can break it down from from denomination to denomination. Um, how differently people interpret and mm -hmm. believe and understand the word of God, mm. you know, now they read the Hebrew text, the Torah, the same way we do. And they have to, my understanding is uh, when they go to Hebrew school, that they have to study the New Testament. Right? Am I right, well, Pastor Sam? The, well, the I ones who want to be and, rabbis. Right. It's, yeah. So mm -hmm. they have a knowledge of everything that we have, uh, but they are limited in what they have accepted as being true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, they learn then, that so they can know how to augur against us when we share the word of God with them. And so the rabbis learn that in good rabbinical schools and that, as they call them. You know, all of them, right. but they learned that some some of the young kids even memorized the whole New Testament. They said, you know, and so do the uh, the Muslims. Mm. Almost all uh, all world religions, the Hindus, and uh, you know, and like you said, it's in order to um, make an argument to yeah. someone trying to convert them. Mm -hmm. uh, so they know how to I know that's the reason the Muslims and uh, uh, more science and all of those uh, 
made up cults that are basically formed in prisons. Um, not the true Muslims, you know, but I'm talking about the, the black Muslims and the ones that, uh, uh, what is that new one? What is that one on the street now? The Hebrew Israelites. Hebrew, black Hebrew I Israelites, right. Um, they are so misinformed and lost. But, um, but anyway, the true Jewish uh, people, uh, like you said, the, and there's so much that they don't accept mm -hmm. in the word of God. Mm -hmm. Like the lady you talked to don't believe that there's a heaven or hell and this right. is it. Yes, There's a lot of people, if you dig deep and talk to a lot of Christians, you know, they look at heaven and hell as being so distant and so unreal until they read about it but they still don't have a concept of what it is so in almost in reality they don't believe that um you know and and i believe that's true because they they don't make preparation to, to go to heaven you know if if you really had an uh, understanding of heaven and hell and how bad hell was and how good heaven is and the way that you get there is to please God and do and live by his word you would be doing everything that you could in this life here and you know to make sure that you go to heaven so you can just tell by the way people live that they don't believe what they read about heaven that there is a heaven that there is a hell it, you know when um, go ahead i was just gonna say there's um <clears throat> christians too that don't even believe the, uh, about the gifts of the spirit that's oh, another tons. portion of the bible that they tons don't believe absolutely yeah and those are what they you know what and they call themselves Christians. That's why the church is weak. Mm -hmm. That's why the, the church of God is weak because the, and the devil has lied to them. You don't have to study the gifts of the spirit. Well, it's like, why did God put it in there? Mm -hmm. You know, why did he tell us to um, desire these gifts and to study? Why did he make it a part of his work? Why did he have Paul and others teach about it? So, you know, that just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And they but, are by far uh, the majority also who do not teach that we need the gifts of the spirit today. Right, they but you, end it, you know. Mm -hmm. Or never did start. Mm -hmm. Well, no, they said, uh, most of them said end it when we got the right, Bible. That's, you know, when the Bible, that's what when, I that, when it's perfect, that, that, comes, that you know. And they call the Bible perfect right. in that sense, yes. Huh? <laughs> they say some of the gifts of the spirit. Sense. No, it don't make sense. No, it's no. it's totally crazy. But I mean, that's the biggest excuse. Uh, big time theologians like John MacArthur or the Southern Baptist Convention, all those people will tell you that it ended those gifts to gifts. No, they don't tongue, believe in gift the of, gifts. You know, but... uh, uh, interpretation of tongues and discernment of spirit that ended after we got the Bible because the Bible is perfect. I discussed it at Lent with a Lutheran uh, seminarian. He was, we was both getting ready to buy a Bible and he was explaining it. And I said, well, show me the scripture where it said, where it ended. Ended. and he yeah, looked where, at me, where does it say that? he looked at me and surprised and like, there is no scripture because he had been really studying and he kept talking and he wanted to learn more, but his mom was with him and she was getting a little bit upset because she saw that he was <laughs> interested and she said, come on, come on, I gotta go. <laughs> no. that, that, that's what happened to me too, Pastor Sam, when I asked that particular person to show me in the Bible right. where it's, it ended, they just started looking and looking and looking, couldn't right. ever find it. Then, then, then we started talking about something else. Yeah. They, they got yeah. off the subject. You well, know, that, like, that goes back to even the story of Mary riding on the donkey. 
-hmm. You know, yeah. that yeah. we pick up things as we go, but never investigate it uh, to see if it's true or where did we get this thinking from? Mm -hmm. You know, so that's why all I'm doing here tonight is in a fun kind of way. Mm -hmm. is to show us that there's so much in the word of God that we can miss and how we need to do so much study yes. to make sure that we are, you know, in, in step with God's word because we can miss things and we do miss things. Oh, yes. Nobody right. ever has it all. Mm -hmm. nobody ever you know that which is perfect if they're calling the bible the bible is perfect but how much do we know of it five percent ten percent the average christian mm -hmm. but um, i mean yes. how many verses can the average script uh um average uh christian uh how many verses have they memorized and able to recite mm -hmm. That shows you how interested the average Christian is. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there's just so much that God wants us to, to learn and to do. Um, you know, there's it, it shouldn't be a guessing game uh, about what we uh, say and, you know, or know in the word of God. Yeah. We have to be factual. Amen. Oh, we did we did we did okay mm -hmm. all righty um let's go on <clears throat> mm -hmm. Ooh, the sword that appeared disappeared mm. let's look and see what that's about the sword that disappeared you ever heard this story you ever heard about this uh sword that went into this guy's stomach and <laughs> I know you have, so. Yeah, that's a yucky story. <laughs> Judges is full of stories about God's harsh dealing with the wickedness of his people and the tyranny of kings and overlords in the promised land. In Judges chapter three, Eglon, king of Moab, is ruling over Israel. Eglon is mean and very, very fat. Ehu is sent to kill Eglon. He sneaks into the king's house and hides in the bathroom. The king comes in to relieve himself, and Ehu stabs him with a sword and kills him. Now, the trouble is, Ehu can't get the sword out because of all of the blubber rolls over it. Thankfully, Ehu escapes because the guard thinks the long wait in the bathroom chamber is something that is usual. In other words, the spad guy spends a lot of time in the bathroom. So uh, he, uh, Ehu had time to get away before they found out that the guy was dead. Let's read this story. A little bit further. Judges 3, 20 through 23. And Ehu came unto him, and he was sitting in a summer parlor, which he had for himself along. And Ehu said, I have a message from God unto thee. And he arose out of his seat. And Ehu put forth his left hand and took a da the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. And the hat also went in after the blade. That's the part you hold. And the fat closed upon the blade so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly. And the dirt came out. Then Ehu went forth through the porch and shut the doors of the parlor upon him and locked them. Okay, so you have... Look at my spell. You have to read the whole, <laughs> I spelled it there. You have to read the whole story. But but uh, yeah, that's the case of the disappearing sword. Mm -hmm. Can, I, can I explain something right there? They could not find 
Yes, sir. Could I say something? Now yes, that sir. was not a regular big long sword. The word dagger, it was like about 12, 14 inches long. Okay. It's not like the sword, you know, like a two foot, three foot sword. That's a, you know, it was a dagger, like he had it hidden down on his right thigh. The, the uh, king did not see the dagger in it. If it had been a big sword, he would have saw him having a sword, you know, scrapped mm -hmm. on his waist and that. It's a different, you can use the term dagger and sword interchangeable in the Old Testament and that, you know, but a dagger is about 12, you know, depending on what kind of dagger you got, you know, 12. The fact is, it went in there and couldn't come out. Right. You could bury easily. I can see if you weighed about 350 pounds, uh, something like a 400 pound, you know, and if it went into his stomach in that sense, he probably was a very strong young man that did it. And that, you know, so that was basically, you know. It didn't come out. Right. <laughs> Any questions, anybody on anything? I, I haven't been stopping to ask you guys. I'm like Pastor Sam, that was a yucky story. <laughs> <laughs> it's an ugly story. Yes, it was. <laughs> but I am going to have to read it. <laughs> Judges three. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read that. <laughs> okay. Let's go on. You must sleep on your left side. You must sleep on your left side. Why? What is that about? Well, let's find out. Okay, there's a um, guy sleeping on him. Well, right now he's sitting up. Okay. In Ezekiel 4, the prophet receives word from God that he is to sleep on his left side for 390 days. And you are to bear their sins, the sins of Israel, for the number of days you lie on your side. Then for 40 days, he sleeps on his right side for Judah. God then assigns a dietary restriction on him, which Ezekiel asks to be revived, revised so he doesn't defile himself. The Lord then says, I will let you bake your bread over cow dung instead of human excrement. Okay. Um, Okay, um, so he had to sleep. Ezekiel slept on his side, on his left side, for 390 days. And what he was doing was, uh, when he say bearing the sins of Israel, praying for, interceding for Israel for that amount of days. What I always think about the, the difference in the number of days that he had to pray or intercede for Israel as opposed to Judah. I wonder why. <laughs> hmm? Israel was a much bigger country than Judah. <laughs> real bigger. Look how, yeah. look how many right. days. It was. It was very, very oh, I, real. Mm -hmm. Had more, um, more tribes. Right. Mm -hmm. More people. So, what two tribes. So what two, uh, how many tribes right. within Judah? Two tribes. Two. Two, right? That's what I thought. Yes. So, but, and I wonder, and it doesn't say, unless I missed it. Um. Was it consecutive? I mean, was it cons You know, could he get up and then lay back down on his left side? Well, no, yeah, he got to get up and cook and all that. Yeah, you know. and and I know it says he he could bake his his food over cow dung instead of human well, excrement. Mm -hmm. At first which, time, at first God told him to use human, you know, but mm -hmm. and then uh, it, he said, "No, I don't want to do that because that's breaking the Levitical law." And that, you know, mm -hmm. so he said, then, "Okay, I'll let, you, I'll let you use, you know, cow dung." Mm -hmm. That's kind of yucky too. Right. Now the prophets today now, they kind of live a little different than the prophets in the old testament. That thing got a a five-star motel, they ain't going there. I'm on a kid. <laughs> that that 
that bait, uh, that stuff probably kind of stink too. Yeah. <laughs> if you know Carl Dunn. <laughs> Well, you're a farm girl, so. <laughs> you know about burning uh, cow manure? No, we don't. We didn't burn no cow manure. I'm just saying. I know it had to stink. I didn't. I didn't smell it before. <laughs> well, we actually, we actually burn cow manure. Yes. Really? Well, it's nothing basic but grass. After you know. I mean, why, why, why did you burn it? It'll burn. It'll help with your fire to keep you warm, and that, you know. Mm. In the house. Yeah, in a stove, you start it out in a I mean, like oven. for heat for your for your house? Yeah, you can it's it's a good kindling kind of. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, okay, pass this down. All righty. You guys so didn't know you was talking to somebody that old, did you? <laughs> or been burning cow manure. That's that's kind of different. Okay, so what we're gonna do, I got a video that, which is kind of along the same lines here, but. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Let me share something. The best vegetables and food that you eat mm -hmm. is raised with cow manure as fertilizer. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say, I knew it as a fertilizer. Mm -hmm. well, I, I mean, if you would eat it, then why wouldn't you burn it? You eat the thing it, it, that come up on, out of but the it's thing. on top. It's put on top of the dirt for the to help the plants. That ain't well. The, yeah, the, I'm the, not eating. It. It. And then We're the substance, it. The, the root of the system draws it up through the plants. Oh, uh, I get okay. Well, I guess well, I didn't think of it like that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's look. Pat, Pastor Yvonne, before you start the video, the, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, um. So. Uh, Ezekiel laying on his side, what does that, is that like a, what does that represent? He was interceding. He was praying for Israel and Judah. And suffering for the, you know. Now, now what, you know, why God decide, had him lay on his side, why that position? I don't know, rather than, you know, opposed to sitting in a chair or laying on his back, you know, the position per se, I, I don't know. Okay. You know, other than he just wanted him to lay on one side and pray for Israel and the other side and pray for Judah. What what would that mean? Um maybe for him to lay prostrate before the Lord. Well, that would be face down. Oh. Oh, okay. Not on this. Well, side. he was praying for them to stop living the life that they was living. Well, they, was to um, get them Sharina to was talking the about the lifestyle. He was interceding a way of another way of intercessory prayer, and that, you know. Serena was asking about the position of, of right. Wife. That's what I'm saying. God, you know, we know why? Mm -hmm. Well, he I mean, told. I guess he wanted him to. Uh, it's not comfortable to lay on one side. He wanted to see how uncomfortable the Israelis was. You know, because you know what serious uh, problem that was going on in Israel. And that, you know, laying on my. I I normally sleep on the same side. You know, I kind of turn around, but my regular side is uh, like on my right side. So if if it if the if it's not cons uh, con consistently mm -hmm. laying down mm -hmm. for day after day after day without getting up, mm -hmm. then it's you know I basically do the same thing. I lay on the same side. I could mm -hmm. say I lay I lay on the same side for you know most of the days in the year but he was suffering we have a nice soft mattress now think about him laying on he didn't have a uh serta mattress to lay on in that you know we can well, lay I mean, on any side in the mattress that. that we have now you know yeah you probably be tossing and turning all the time and uh he might have been sleeping on the floor the picture you showed him sleeping you know mm -hmm. or just something roll up on the floor sleeping mat or something you know no, I think the whole point is he was praying and interceding and because suffering. if that's his regular place to sleep every night, it's mm -hmm. no different. Mm -hmm. It if, could be if both ways, he, yeah. But I know. think it was because he was showing okay. the suffering. He was suffering and interceding 
uh, okay. in that sense. It just gave credit to what a great prophet that he was, that he would do that also, that God would use him, you know. Amen. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's look. At the Bible's been accused of being an outdated book of superstition, written by people who didn't understand the scientific workings of the real world. Now, this accusation is patently false. Not only does the Bible not contain errors and superstitious statements, but it contains amazing scientific facts that were written down thousands of years before we in modern scientific times understood how important they were. I'm going to give you a list of six scientific facts that validate the Bible. Number one, blood being the liquid of life. In the 21st century, we understand how important blood is. We have studied it and seen its capabilities and its importance to life. But that knowledge was not well known in the past. In fact, in the past, ignorance of just how important blood is has caused some learned men to do some very tragic things. Up until the 19th century, Doctors believe that harmful vapors entered the blood and caused sickness. For this reason, those doctors would literally bleed their patients by putting leeches on them or cutting the veins and arteries in the elbow and getting that blood out. The first president of the United States of America, George Washington, came down with a cold and his doctor was called and he literally bled him to death. So what does that have to do with the Bible? Well, thousands of years before this lethal practice of bloodletting was in vogue, the Bible stated in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, for the life the of the flesh is in the blood. And just a few verses down, it said that an animal's blood sustains its life. Today, we completely understand the truthfulness of this biblical statement. But how did an ancient shepherd like Moses in 1450 BC know that the life of the flesh is in the blood? It took the modern scientific medical community thousands of years and thousands of lives to discover this truth. Scientific fact number two, sanitation practices. Some of the worst plagues in modern times have been caused by improper sanitation practices. In 1846, the city of London had a terrible cholera epidemic. 16,000 people had been killed. Well, why could the doctors of the day do nothing to combat this deadly disease? You see, the city of London had a serious problem with sewage. The streets were filled with raw sewage that people would literally open their second and third story windows and dump into the streets. Now, as we know in our modern scientific era, raw sewage carries disease and causes all types of medical problems. If the people in London in 1846 had turned their Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 12, they would have read this. Also, you shall have a place outside the camp where you may go out and you shall have an implement among your equipment. And when you sit down outside, you shall dig with it and turn and cover your refuse. 3,300 years before London's epidemic, the Bible had implemented a plan to stop such epidemics before they started. Amazing scientific fact number three, an understanding of germs. In 1847, about 18% of women who went into a modern medical facility to give birth would die. That's one out of every six. Well, why was the death rate so high? The medical professors and the students, before that they would give the treatments to the live women, they would do autopsies on dead women. And then they would not wash their hands properly. They would many times wash them in a bowl with no germ-killing agent whatsoever, dry them on a dirty towel, and then perform those examinations on live women. Well, if you're looking at that from a 21st century observer's point of view, you realize that's terrible. They're passing germs from the dead bodies of ladies who are dying and giving those germs to the live women because they're not washing their hands. But to Europeans in the middle of the 19th century, that idea of passing a germ well, was a completely foreign idea to them. 
when the doctors and medical students implemented hand washing procedures. The death rate plummeted from 18% to about 2%. These doctors in the mid 1800s had made an amazing discovery, or, or had they? Is it possible that the doctors simply rediscovered something that had already been known? Well, almost 3,500 years before the 1850s, the Bible stated, he who touches the dead body of anyone shall be unclean seven days. He shall purify himself with the water on the third day and on the seventh day, then he will be clean. But if he does not purify himself on the third day and on the seventh day, he will not be clean. You'll find that in Numbers chapter 19 verses 11 and 12. You see, the Israelites were instructed to wash their hands in water with germ killing agent in it 3,500 years before in modern medical times we knew that should be done. Amazing scientific fact number four, ship engineering. While you don't go to the Bible for blueprints for a, a huge barge, you don't think, it just so happens that maybe that is where you go. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 15, the Bible says that a man by the name of Noah builds an ark that's 300 cubits long by 50 cubits wide by 30 cubits high. And it just so happens this is a ratio of 30 to 5 to 3 length to breadth to height. Well, for thousands of years, the ark was the largest floating ship on record. In 1844, a man named Isamabard K. Brunel built a huge ship called the Great Britain, and he used a similar ratio to that of the ark, 30 to 5 to 3. As it turns out, that 30 to 5 to 3 length to breadth to height ratio is the perfect ratio to build a huge boat that doesn't need to go anywhere very quickly, but needs to stay afloat and carry tons and tons of supplies. That same ratio, 30 to 5 to 3, was used by shipbuilders in World War II when they built ships called Liberty ships that were designed to carry tremendous amounts of cargo. You see, Brunel and those engineers that were building those Liberty ships, they had generations of shipbuilding knowledge but Noah's was literally the first of its kind. Where did he get that kind of information? Well, I would suggest to you from the master ship builder. Amazing fact number five, quarantine. You see, in today's world of advanced medicine and understanding of germs, the idea of quarantining sick patients and separating them from those who are well, well, it's standard practice but it certainly wasn't in the ancient world because they didn't understand germs till about 200 years ago and they didn't see a need to keep sick people separate from people who were not sick. In the Bible, however, thousands of years before modern medical science understood the spread of germs, detailed measures to prevent their spread. In the book of Leviticus, we read that people with diseases such as leprosy were instructed to dwell alone outside the camp. We read that in Leviticus 13, 46. And if and when an individual got close to somebody who is not diseased, this diseased individual was told to cover his mustache or upper lip and cry unclean. Why? Why do we tell our children to cover their mouths when they cough? Well, to keep that diseased spittle from going into the air and from infecting others airborne. When we look at these instructions in Leviticus and we see that Leviticus had an understanding of contagion and quarantine that surpasses that of any other nation, it's interesting that the Encyclopedia of Medical History says this. The idea of contagion was foreign to the classic medical tradition and found no place in the voluminous Hippocratic writings. The Old Testament, however, is a rich source for contagionist sentiment, especially in regard to leprosy and venereal disease. Now here again, the Old Testament exhibits amazingly accurate medical knowledge that surpasses anything known that the humans who were alive at the time during the writer's lives could have possibly come up with on their own. Amazing scientific fact number six, food regulations. In the United States, we have the Food and Drug Administration, it's the FDA. 
and it's designed to make regulations that keep people from getting sick from foodborne diseases mostly. Knowing that certain kinds of food, such as pork, are more prone to carry disease, the FDA will make a regulation like this. You can go into a restaurant, you can order a beef steak that is rare. But if you go into that restaurant and you order a pork chop, you can't order it rare. Why? Well, because pork, if it's not cooked properly, has a much higher probability of causing some type of disease. But we know that in modern times. But the Bible, especially the Old Testament, written some 3,000 years before modern times, exhibits a knowledge of food-borne diseases that surpasses anything that was around during the time of the writers. For instance, when you look in Leviticus chapter 11, it mentions that pork was not to be eaten. Well, that's a wise regulation, as we have seen. Even the modern FDA puts regulations in along those lines. But the text also forbids the consumption of bats. You say, well, I don't want to eat a bat. Well, some people do, in fact, around the world. Bats, in some places, are a delicacy. Why not eat bats? Just so happens that bats have a very high probability of carrying viruses that can be caught by humans, especially the rabies virus. Also, in Leviticus 11, we read that things like lizards, salamanders, amphibians are not to be eaten. Well, why? Well, lizards, salamanders, amphibians, etc. have about a 90% contamination rate of salmonella. Salmonella, a bacteria that causes many people to get violently sick and some of them to die. You see, the Bible never gets a single medical fact wrong and it exhibits a knowledge of scientific facts that is thousands of years ahead of its time. That scientific accuracy proves the Bible's divine origin. All right. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. You know, I was going to say, I thought people ate bats, but I didn't say nothing. But see, they do. Probably everything that was on that list that we saw. Somebody, yeah, somebody somewhere. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> somewhere, somewhere people eat bats. Yeah. Right. In third world countries, they probably eat anything that they can catch. Yeah, 